So welcome uh, to this uh, interview. My name is Sebastian. I'm the head sommelier of Tasting Table and Taste Hungary. And today I have the great honor of being with one of Hungary's most influential wine personalities, uh, Agnes Niemet. She, is, uh, she has extraordinary CV. Uh, you, you're going to find out through the interview just a few words about her. She was the editor-in-chief of uh, what used to be called Decanter Hungary, and now it's called Vince Magazine. Uh, for more than 12 years, she now runs HungarianWine.eu. She's a well-known wine judge. Uh, she is an e event operator. She e organizes these great wine events and so much more. So Agnes, thank you. Thank you for being, being here with us. Thank you for the opportunity. So, uh, Agnes, uh, as I mentioned, you, you, you worked in, uh, for 12 years as ed editor-in-chief of Hungary's most famous uh, wine magazine. Do you remember what was the first topic that you wrote about all those years ago? Of course, I remember clearly. The first edition, the first issue was about 100 wines you have to try before you die. That's a, that's a very nice first edition. Yes, I remember it was, uh, it was hard work to, to arrange the cover, the title on the cover of the magazine. And, and it was really, really hard work at the beginning for me. And we are talking about what year, what month? 2004. And it was, uh, we started, I was, uh, I was applied in, employed in July. And the first issue came out in September. Okay. And how was this the, the, the first ever decanter that was called at the time? Or you started with the magazine and it was already uh, ongoing? It was the first, first issue and the first ever and the first ever licensed decanter. Okay. So uh, the English edition in London, they uh, launched an edition in Asia, but it was them, the British editor team. Okay. And the owners of the company, which I worked for, they decided to license a wine magazine and they were looking around and they, um, they thought that Decanter was the most reputable and the most uh, trustworthy. So they decided to license and um, they were seeking for a, for a person who is new in the wine world. I don't know why, but that was the idea. And I was quite a beginner at that time. Okay. So I had to learn everything. Did you have any, any wine experience before or any, let's say, of course, in, interest in wine for sure, but uh, did you have any, was this your first wine work? Yes. Okay. So I, I loved drinking wine and maybe I paid a little bit more attention to labels than, than the average people, but that was all. Okay. And uh, what do you remember was the top or were the top uh, wines of that time, uh, 2004? Yes, at that time uh, there, were, there were much less wineries and much bigger names. So there were all these famous uh, Gere and Tumerer and all these big names, which are big names at the moment as well. But uh, I think the biggest difference is that now there are much more wineries. A lot of smaller ones, a lot of, uh, a lot of new wines with new styles. And at that moment, there were only some uh, post-communist companies, so some big wineries, which were transformed into, they were privatized and they started to work in a different format. So there were these companies and the ones who could get back their land and, um, and, and basically who were the pioneers of that wine revolution or the new, new age of Hungarian wines. So when you think about what Hungarians were drinking in 2004, uh, wine styles, wine colors, whatever, and what they are drinking these days, uh, do you see any change? Yes, I think there were much more baric favorites. So a lot of people, of course, I'm talking about a little bit more educated wine lovers because uh, the average people, is a different case. At that moment, they were not drinking too much wine. I think people were just learning about 
wines. Now, if you go to a wine bar, you can see a lot of people drinking rosés or in wine festivals. Now it's common to have a glass of rosé in, in people's hands. At that moment, it was not as common. But those people who were a little bit more educated, they tried to discover these important wine regions and the pioneers of, of Hungarian wine life. And I think um, at the beginning, we drank much more heavily oaked wines, which was not bad. Okay. But because, because these winemakers went to France, they learned how to age wine, and they used a lot of new oak. So, of course, it was a, how to say, it was a, a special word on the label, barik. So, barik, okay. <laughs> so people paid more. If yeah. was... now, now people are trying to get more fresh, crispier, easier to drink wines, right? Than maybe the, in those days of big, big bodied wines. Exactly. So uh, I know that one very important thing these days in the magazine, I know that you don't work there anymore, but you still help them, uh, is the is the Vince test or the or the or the tasting. Uh, did you come up with that idea of the of the um, blind tasting of the wines, or uh, was that when 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 did that that happen? That uh, tasting part of the magazine. Well, in fact, it was uh, it was the Canta magazine itself. And uh, because, because we licensed the magazine and we licensed the test method as well. So the tasting coordinator of the English magazine came over and uh, we tried to do exactly as they do. Okay. And uh, it's, it's really independent. So I, I, I strongly recommend anyone to trust uh, Vince test and decanter test previously because it's always blind tasting, always quite a good group of people who know a lot about that topic. So it's objective and it's independent. Great. So I know that you've, I mean, since you were the editor in chief and now you are, uh, you are um, invited to this fancy international wine, uh, you know, not a co competitions, right? Everywhere. Tell us a little bit about how, how a wine competition looks like from the inside. Uh, how many wines you have to taste? Of course, I think it, it must vary from, from, any, from, from all the, 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 the concepts, but what, what can you tell us? How does it work uh, from, from the inside? Being, being a wine judge, how, how is, is it so extraordinary as it sounds, tasting delicious wines? How, how is it? Well, it's hard work. Of course, you have to concentrate. So everyone is envious, especially my family, when, uh, in, when there is no COVID. Usually, I travel once a month somewhere. So, for example, uh, I was invited to China three times last year, two years ago, and I went to other countries. But um, it's not only fun. Of course, it's hard work because you have to concentrate. And of course, you are traveling alone, so I can never take anyone with me. And of course, usually when you are in a competition, you spend 20 hours with other people because in the morning you have all the tastings, usually about 40, 50 wines per morning for three days. And then in the afternoon we have kind of uh, extra programs, but these are always to get to know the wine region, the invitation, the country, which the host country. So for example, the last one was Concord Mundial. It was at the beginning of September. So in the afternoon we visited the wine region. It was in Moldova, in the Moravia, in okay. the Czech Republic. Okay, so uh, where 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 have you been, uh, wine judge? What are these? Uh, what are, what are the names and the places where these uh, competitions actually uh, happen? So, for example, Concours Mondial, the Brussels, it's uh, organized in Brussels because the team of the organizers they they are in they are based in Brussels, but they travel every year to a different country to host the event. So it's been organized in several places and I've been to Vin Italy okay. and I've been to Silk Route competition. This is another Chinese uh, thing because Concord was also held in China one year. And Silk Route is again a Chinese invention because China wants to be a superpower in wine as well. <laughs> yeah, they take it seriously. Okay. So they organize big, huge wine events to show their ability, their potential. And... Uh... 
do you find any specific um, wine competition to be super exciting for you as a wine judge or because of the wines that are being tasted are so different? Or is there a specific wine competition or wine contest that we as consumers should keep an eye on that if you see a golden medal, for example, or whatever, IWS or Decanter or whatever, is, is that, do, do you have any, any favorite that is closer to your heart? Yes. Well, in terms of exciting competition, maybe there was one long time ago in Romania. It was in Temeshvar, in Timisoara. Okay. And uh, the results were just the opposite. So the better result a wine got, the worse it was. Okay. Because it was a long time ago. It was okay about 15 years ago. And at those times, it was... A especially in Eastern European countries, it was a kind of practice to buy medals. Yeah. And if we, get, if we went lower, then the bronze medal wines were good. Okay. But that was a long time ago. And later I went to uh, Vinul Romania, which was again a Romanian uh, competition organized by um, a magazine. Unfortunately, they don't exist anymore. But I liked it a lot because they bought all the wines. Okay. They said, we don't, want to, we don't want to rely on the producers because they might not send the, the exact wine. Okay. So that's why they bought all the wines. Of course, it cost a lot of money because they invited uh, judges, sure. they paid for travel, everything. And a lot of other competitions. Uh, Concours Mundial, for, for example, which I mentioned to you, they've just opened a huge wine bar in Mexico, in Mexico City. Okay. And all the gold medal wines of the Concours are uh, available to taste and to buy. Wow. So I think it's something extra. I think that nowadays it's not enough to organize a wine competition. It's not enough to offer those stickers. A wine competition should offer something extra because there are too many. And uh, they compete for the attention of the wine growers, of the, of the winemakers. So um, this, this is something extra. Of course, Mexico City is far from here. It's yeah. not something uh, attractive for a Hungarian winemaker, but maybe it's attractive for some others. But uh, I think there are a lot of good ideas with the uh, competitions, like uh, Glass of Bubbly. I wonder if you, if you know them. No, no. It's also English and a sparkling competition. And what they do, they create categories adjusted to the consumers, to the situation. So it's more like if you go on a date, what sort of sparkling wine would you drink? Great. And the, and the sparkling wines are tasted according to the categories. So I think that's also something extra. Of course, there are the big ones like Decanter and um, International Wine Challenge. I think these are the most respected ones, especially if I look at the number of Hungarian winemakers, I can see that the most entries go to the Decanter World Wine Awards. This year there were 125 Hungarian medals, which is a big number. So of course these, these are quite reputable, renowned uh, competitions, but I think those ones like this glass of bubbly and some others might be interesting. So uh, you've clearly tasted wines from all the world and uh, you know how a wine business, uh, I mean, what are the ideas behind? You've, you all have good friends in the wine business as well. So how do you see Hungarian wine in an international perspective? Uh, do you find it uh, unique? Do you find that Hungary has a, a, a place in the market? Uh, what, what, what do you think? I'm sure there is, of course. <laughs> that's my job, that's my mission, and that's my heart, sure. But indeed, as, as I told you, this, uh, these wine events, wine competitions, for example, they are also about networking. So uh, I usually stay till late to discuss everything with the, with the fellow wine writers and other people, because this is the most important part of every event these uh, last last hours yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and based on a lot of conversation and interviews that we've made for for hungarianwine.eu we always realize that hungarian wines are interesting 
We have a lot of fantastic grape varieties. We have, of course, Tokai, which has a name. But still, we need a lot of, lot of more education and marketing. So Eufark is, for example, a, a, a wonderful grape variety, and it's unique. But how can you explain a foreigner, a, an Englishman, to taste Eufark? You cannot compare it to anything. Yeah. So it's, just, it's just not enough. And uh, I can see a lot of examples in the world. For example, Georgia or Greece, which are about the same, about, we have many similarities with these countries regarding uh, reputation and the number of wineries and, and things like this, but they are, they are a little bit better at marketing. Okay. So, I mean, we have to realize that it's not enough to go to a, to a for example, to provide China once in three years, it's not enough. If you want to do something, you have to be in that country. Like, um, there was an Indian lady, uh, a guest of, uh, the winner of the last year competition. Yeah, she won against me, I think. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so when she came to Hungary, uh, she, she spent a few days with me. And of course, I spent, I asked a lot of questions about Hungarian wines and the potential of selling Hungarian wines in India. And what she said is that we are just not visible. So if we want to achieve something, we have to do something like the Italian in that market. So they hire a big house and uh, on every level there are producers and they, they have an office there and they regularly have events. So I think uh, we have potential, of course, because we are exciting. And it's good also that uh, we have a small amount of wines, but uh, that's suitable for a special niche market. So we have, we have the market. We just have to teach. <laughs> and that takes a lot of time and energy. I think we have the wines, we have the potential. We don't have the marketing uh, figured out yet. I think at the moment, what happens is that we have some national marketing and we have a lot of um, missionaries like me and like Zsuzsa Toroni, I wonder if you know her in London. You can, yeah. She lives there and, and there are some others. So a lot of people do their job seriously, but that's not enough, of course, because, uh, because there should be more money put into it. Okay. But I think I can see some signs, so it's changing. But definitely, we should do something for it. Well, we we here in Taste Hungary, as you know, we work very hard to to yes, yes, that's also spread, awesome. the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's spread the word. I know what you mean to spread the word of Hungarian wines, and and we are we are in for the challenge. We love it. Congratulations to the Drink Drinks Business. Drink Award. Business Award. Thank you, thank you. Very, it was very very high high uh, peak of this 2020 weird, weird year. <laughs> so um, you've been basically everywhere within Hungary and in most of the uh, famous and iconic wine states of Europe. Do you have any specific incredible experience that you'd like to share with us? Let's say one in Hungary that, that you never forget because a special wine or something and one outside Hungary, maybe a visit or a wine or, or a moment you were sitting next to somebody or, or something like that. Well, it's so difficult. It's so difficult indeed. I like water and the sight of water. So whenever I have something close to the water, I like it. So for example, there was one trip to Luxembourg. Luxembourg is not known as a wine country, but there are incredible wines, Rhine Rieslings, method tra tra traditional sparkling wines. And it's the other side of the river Mosel. Yeah. And the river is green. It has an incredible color. So I remember those sightseeings. And maybe, maybe the top moment is when uh, I won a wine writer award, Millezima in mm -hmm. France. And my prize was a special luxury exclusive trip to Bordeaux. And we visited top wineries. And we had a, a dinner with Chateau Margot, owner, lady, I can't pronounce her name, the Greek lady. <laughs> and it was, it was an amazing lunch. We were only eight people, the winners, and about eight people from the winery. The owner, 
her son, her daughter, and we were treated like kings and queens. <laughs> so it was amazing. Those <laughs> are the birds. The mm. birds of, of writing about wine is that you get to have these great experiences. Yes, there's a any, any special uh, moment uh, within Hungary that you uh, re remember? A lot, that, that's really, I can't pick one. Maybe I can pick one because we have a little holiday house next to, next to Lake Balaton. It's, a, it's an old house with a little vineyard. Unfortunately, we tried to make wine, but it was a disaster. So I leave it to the professionals, <laughs> but uh, it's in St. George Hedge. Mm -hmm. You know that? Yeah, sure. San George Mountain, the volcanic hill, and being there in the vineyard near these volcanic rocks, near the lake, that's always the best moment. So we survived quarantine there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Balaton is extraordinary. So if you have to think of a grape or a region or a place or, or a wine, um, I don't know related thing that Hungary has but is not very popular right now and you think it has great potential and might become the next you know we we like to compare us with Austria unfortunately and we like to say it's going to be the next Gruner Veltliner of the world the next big big thing do you do you find there's a a, a hidden jewel within um, Hungarian wine scene hmm. a good question well I'm glad to see and to hear and to taste a lot of red wines with much more elegance. As I told you at the beginning, this barrack age is, seems to be over. And now wines are much more elegant and Cake Frankosh absolutely fits. And as you mentioned, Austria, they are also, their Blau Frankish is much more famous, especially uh, overseas. If you think of uh, wine lovers of the United States, most, most of some of them, they, they know Blau Frankish, why they haven't heard about uh, Cake Frankosh, which is the same. Ah. So I think Cake Frankosh is something coming up. And um, of course, we have a lot of uh, Furmint. Furmint is great and harsh level. And even if you think of Tokai Dry, of course, there's a debate if, if it's the grape variety or should we market, should we use for marketing Tokai Dry? I don't want to decide on any of the any of these parties but definitely those wines are fantastic but i think it's also important to think of what we have a lot which is the aromatic grape varieties so we have a lot of irshai and um, cersegi and traminer and these are in some in good hands they can be really elegant so, I mean, not only for, for mass production and not only as a fresh uh, wine, which as a spritz, but also it can be more. So if like, if you think of the Italian Pinot Grigio, which became a number one in the United Kingdom and everyone wants Pinot Grigio, it's something like uh, it can happen to a Hungarian aromatic wine. I can imagine that because we have substantial amounts and more and more producers do it well. So I think that's something that we, should, we shouldn't look down on these varieties. Of course, some educated wine lovers think that all oh, these aromatic wines are, are not for me. They are for beginner, young girls. But I think they have a much better place if they are done well. Well, I'm regarding the orange wine, pet nothing. I think they are, ex of course, it's important to, to experiment. But that's not something uh, that should be put forward. Okay. And I know that you are now in Spain, in Catalonia, in the beautiful, charming capital of sparkling wine of Cava, San Sadurní de Anoya. Yeah. Uh, so you, you know your sparkling wine. You, if you want to, you can have it for breakfast every day, uh, just okay. for your neighbor. Unfortunately, it contains calories. <laughs> that's good. So you drink Brut nat Natur. Zero yeah. sugar. Okay. <laughs> so how do you see Hungarian sparkling wines? Do you, do you see that that's a thing that uh, producers must focus? Do you find any grape working par or any region working par par particularly well with that? Yes, yes, definitely. I'm, first of all, I'm so happy that finally uh, the portfolio of the wineries is uh, increased 
with a sparkling wine, I think it's great and I'm happy with that. And of course it needed some change of the regulation because there were some legal obstacles to produce sparkling wines in every winery. And I'm glad, I'm glad that they, they do it now. And um, I think at the beginning, maybe there was a problem of overpriced uh, sparkling wines, especially in Tokai. I can, um, I remember a lot of Tokai producers who started, but uh, the price of the sparkling wine was equal with the champagne. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it comes to 10,000 forints, you know, which is about yeah. 13 yeah. or more euros, then, then people think that, okay, it's a Hungarian sparkling wine. And for that price, I can buy a champagne. So that's not a good point. It, okay, I can understand that it costs a lot to produce those wines, especially if you have to transfer the wine to another winery. You have to pay for the winery to, to make the sparkling with, the, with all, the, all the machines. But the price is a, is a problem. However, now I can see a lot of good sparkling wines at medium prices. So about half, three, four, five thousand forints. And it's good to see that a lot of um, uh, local grape varieties are used. So for example, Friedman Ezerio, which is available yes. at State Hungary. I think it's a great thing. Ezerio has a lot of acidity, so why not? I like that sparkling wine. So I think it's, it's just great that we have uh, local ones, Kik Nielu, which is an exciting grape variety. Why not to try it as a sparkling wine? Maybe it's not something that, that the winemakers can sell abroad, but I think it's important if someone comes to their place and they want to taste, they will be happy to, to include a sparkling in the range. And also for events, for dinners, so it's good that we have this colorful sparkling wine in Hungary. That's great. Yeah, I think also it's, it's a very good thing. So let's talk about now your, your main project, Hungarian Wines, that you or you're the editor-in-chief, uh, yes. as you must, of course. How did you came up with the idea? Um, how, how is, uh, what is Hungarian Wines that EU? What is it that you guys do? And how, how, how is, it, how is your, your experience so far? showing Hungarian wines to an English-speaking audience? Well, it was very simple because uh, we were at a ProVine uh, exhibition long, long time ago, five or six years ago, yes, five years ago. And, uh, sorry, the neighbor is shouting. <laughs> you, are, you, are, you are in Spain, that it's only, only pre pre predictable. <laughs> so we were at ProVine uh, in Dusseldorf and uh, I was uh, working together with, uh, with the organizers of the Hungarian stands and uh, the Hungarian masterclasses. And there was, um, I think it was Elizabeth Gabe, Master of Wine, and she received a book of Hungarian excellencies. That was a book by the Ministry of Agriculture. And she said, it's great, it's in English, fantastic, but I won't put it in my small suitcase. Is it available online? and it was not available. Okay. So we said, are those wines available anywhere online? I mean, the information, the wine descriptions, the grape varieties and so on. And there was no official website about Hungarian wines, which is a shame. So if, you, if we want to be famous, how? There's wine of Austria. We, we made a map about the neighboring countries Wine of Austria, even wine of Slovakia, Slovenia, everything, all around, except for wine of Ukraine. Okay, so there's one country behind us. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a shame. So we started to, we made a big plan. We asked all the different uh, agencies, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Foreign Ministry of Foreign Trade. Also, we tried with the um, National Agent Tourism Agency, the wine marketing, everyone. But we didn't get any support, so we decided to ask the winemakers. So we went to the winemakers and asked them, see, that's the situation. There's no official website. So what if for the price of a couple of coffees, we will do it for you? So what we do is that we get a little subscription from some wineries. And for this subscription fee, 
we list them on the website and monthly, at least once a month, we publish a piece of news of every wineries which are, who are uh, our partners. And we do a lot of corresponding and events and a lot of things. So we are kind of missionaries. With this. Just today, I received four emails. There was one American uh, luxury travel magazine. They were asking for some photos about Villagne. There was a British man who wants to import sweet wine, sweet red wine. Well, why not? <laughs> he has special clientele. And there was a decanter magazine. They needed some information. And there was a wine competition who sent me the results. So we are uh, always on the top of the list in Google if you search for wines of Hungary or Hungarian wines. And of course, we get a lot of emails. And then we reply every emails and we forward it to the producers. So for example, this uh, gentleman who wants uh, sweet red wines, he will be directed to those producers who have sweet, sweet red. wine. Why not? So basically, since the official, uh, I don't know, agencies uh, are not willing to do this job, you are doing it, basically. Yes, but I must, I must uh, tell you that uh, the official, the National Tourism Agency has just launched the English language website. I wonder if you have seen it. Bor.hu, I've seen Bor.hu. That, that yes, but now they started uh, winesofhungary.hu as well. Okay. Which is quite nice, but I think it's not the same. That's, their website is, uh, it, it can be a good help if someone comes to Hungary and they have a list of the basic information about uh, Hungarian viticulture, and they have a directory, they have a search to find a lot of wineries, so it's nice. But I think um, they don't have the capacity to, to write a piece of news every day and to correspond with all the people, so, uh, and there are no wine fact sheets. Okay. So it's more about, it's more for tourists who come to Hungary. And we are more to connect Hungarian wineries with the uh, foreigner members of the trade. Okay. So I think they are two different things. But we must be happy that finally the official website has started as well. Right. In your webpage, Hungarian Wines, that you, you also do a web wine writing competition. This year was the third, um, the third edition of it. I've been, I have to confess, I've, I've participated in the last two and I won I won that this year and I last year I also won the, the, the special award. Uh, tell us about how we, how this whole competition came to be, how, what has been the response, how does it work? Um, tell us about it. Well I think you shouldn't be so humble. <laughs> so <laughs> you're one of the winners, which is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I think um, because we have a fantastic jury every year, so uh, yes. Uh, the idea came from this French, com French uh, competition, which I told you about, which was in uh, 2017, Millezima. This is a French uh, web shop selling fine wines, really top, top chateau wines. And, um, and uh, when I won this competition, I thought that this is a fantastic idea. And of course, I talked to them about copying a kind of this competition, but, uh, but it's a kind of copy of that one. Not really. There are some differences because we want to promote Hungarian wines more. They, are not, they don't care about the topic of, uh, of, of the writings, but we focus on Hungary, Hungarian wines or, or something that is related to Hungary. So the idea was to help Hungarian wine producers with this attention. And it works. So I'm really happy because, um, because there's a growth. And in the first year, there were 40 something. And then last year, there were 52, probably. And this year, there were 61 articles. And this is amazing. I've just learned that Jensis Robinson has a wine writer competition. And she had 72 articles. So Jensis uh -huh. Robinson has 72. And we have 61. Then I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good that we have uh, people can enter in Hungarian. So, of course, because we 
we are in Hungary, and, of, and uh, people from other countries. So at least we can attract some attention to Hungary with this competition of ours, especially because of the judges. As you know, this year we had Felicity Carter, who is the editor-in-chief of the most important German wine online publication, and Tamlin Curin, she writes for Genesis Robinson, and Richard from uh, Bayer.net. Bayer so these people also, they also look at Hungary for, for, a, for a short time. So it's good. I'm, I'm so happy with that. That's, that's, an extra, that's an extraordinary experience for us, wine writers, and the, and the prize is incredible, the wine trip that, that we enjoy to Tokai, Vila, and several producers, actually. It's a, the kind of thing that you, that you want to, to have, really. So yeah, I hope that the, the, yeah this trip was, was, was really nice. Was incredible. Yeah. yeah, it was uh, one of the top things of this year. For wow. Me. So uh, you've read hundreds of uh, new and well experienced wine writers uh, because of this contest and of your, your job as an editor. What would you give, what advice would you give to, um, to a wine writer that is either starting or it's, it's already doing its job but wants to get better? What is the few things that you recommend or do you find any any common mistake or any common uh, flaw that that people um you know use a lot or give us give us some some advices please well i think a uh, uh, wine writer is a journalist and the journalist always has to look behind things so it's not enough to get the information from a press uh, release we always have to ask questions and to get some, some piece of information which the others don't have. So for example, there are many prizes um, uh, which, which are, how um, uh, to tell you. So maybe there's a prize. Someone won a, an amazing prize. She's, um, to say, the top, 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 top influencer. And everyone uh, congratula congratulates to this person. But what was the competition? How was it to enter? Was there any other people? Was there a shortlist? Without uh, having this piece of information, the original piece of information is not worth too much. So I think it's always important to ask questions, to investigate. And another thing is that we mustn't copy. It happens a lot of times that people use even at the competition. There were some examples, uh, even uh, in English speaking um, entries, that people used a piece of information and it was not credited. It was not uh, mentioned that this is from someone else. Of course, you can quote, why not? You can cite an important piece of, uh, an important sentence, but then um, the credit should be given. That's, that's another thing. And the most important is probably that you should identify the, re reader so if you are writing for wine lovers then then it should be more interesting full of stories should be colorful because otherwise they will be bored and if it's if, if it's for winemakers okay it can be more technical but then it should be useful for them so then you should have a lot of include a lot of relevant information which they can profit from so it's also important to target the reader to to and to use a lot of stories. So uh, that's a great advice. Thank you, by the way. And uh, finally, I've asked you to check our uh, tastehungry.eu and tastehungry.us wine selections of our uh, web shops and pick one or a few or as many as you like wines uh, that you would recommend to any wine lover um, either if they are starting with Hungarian wines or if they already know them and they want to taste something great. Did you find something interesting? I'm, I'm, I'm very, very curious of your, of your picks. Oh, yes. Yes, I found, as I told you yesterday, in fact, I found too many. <laughs> so it's hard to pick one or two because especially in the EU uh, selection, there are lots of good wines. But maybe uh, I would pick first a uh, white uh, blend, which is called Agri Chilog. 
because I think it's a fantastic idea that the producers of a wine region, Eger, they created something new. They have the red blend, Picove or Bruce blood, as known all over the world, maybe. But they thought that they need a white blend as well. And they created a really nice blend, which is, which, which is never too aromatic. And it's easy to drink, but it can be a little bit more complex. So it's a really good blend. And if they go, do it well, then it's, um, I think it can be a, a, a competition for, for, for a good Chenin Blanc or for, a good, uh, for any good wines of uh, France. No, of course, not for Burgundy, but for many wines. And uh, Tote Ferenc Winery, for example, that's available there, Agri Chillog Superior which is a blend of four grape varieties. And you have Olas Riesling, which is the most widely planted grape variety in Hungary, but also Ryan Riesling and Hash Levelu, and I think Kirai Leanko. Yeah. So it's a blend, and part of the wine is aged in barrel, but the other part is um, made in a reductive way. So it's not too okay, but, but it's nice. And, and it, it's a good idea to show, to show Hungarian wine and, and show the the ability to unite, the winemakers are able to unite because Hungarian people are known as a nation of full of quarrels, always disagreeing, but there are good examples as well. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And uh, something else uh, which I picked. Also, I think it's important to show that we have good uh, examples of international grape varieties. So Hungary is not only these unpronounceable local grapes like Jezdegifu Seresh and, and things that your tongue twisters, but also we have international grapes like a good Chardonnay from, from Eger by Kovács Nimrod, for example, or, or Haiman from Villagne. Uh, of course, Villagne is mostly known as a red wine region, but the Chiclos part is suitable for white wines. And his Rhine Riesling is amazing. So that's again another thing to show about Hungary, and also in um, uh, your in, in the U.S. web in the U.S. selection of Taste Hungary, I looked at it, and there are a lot of small producers, and I'm great, uh, and I think it's great that you can see a lot of really gems to discover, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, and I realized that there's Boit. Yes. It's a small winery and they have Bikovir, uh, which is the red blend from Eger. And I remember that uh, my husband and me, we used to run a cafe in Hungary for a while. It was a short venture in our life, but we loved it. And we had, we have, we had a few wines on the wine list, some Spanish wines and some Hungarian wines. And we had Boit on our wine list and it was one of the most popular wines because it had a good price, and it was easy drinking, silky, fruity, but still complex enough. So it was, a, it was amazing. We loved it. That's great. I think we are run off, we ran out of the boat in the States. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah, I but saw it was, it. It was you great. Still, you yeah. still have Saint Andrea? Saint Andrea, yes. Yes, we yes and two, two different Bicover. Aldash, which is, a, which is a amazing, again, a velvety, lovely, wine and, mm -hmm. and another one hungach which is a bit uh, more expensive but that's also worth trying well agnes thank you very much for all your work for being here with us um we will do our best to show hungarian wines to whoever is interested in it so uh, thank you for your work and thank you for being here thank you thank you for for the interview and i'm so happy that you ask questions uh, maybe i spoke too much but <laughs> no. That's exactly what we needed. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you. Bye-bye.